I said most observers and most politicians would refer to the uh, international project in Afghanistan from 2020, 2001 to 2021 as a failure. Some would even say it was a defeat. Uh, Norway's Afghanistan Commission, of which I was a member, was uh, somewhat more modest. But when it handed in its report in mid-2016, it concluded that uh, the situation in Afghanistan remains discouraging. And as we speak, a number of countries that were involved, to mention some, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands and the US, are about to conduct comprehensive reviews. In my area, research, there are quite a few people who think that they know exactly what it is that went wrong. There are even those who would say that uh, had they only listened to me or listened to the experts, this would have ended up entirely differently. And whereas I think that analysts, researchers, even seasoned uh, foreign correspondents may have a lot to uh, contribute, I would be warning anybody against listening to the analyst who claims to have the response. We certainly do need knowledge both about Afghanistan and about specific teams related to Afghanistan. And that knowledge needs to be a lot deeper than uh, easy claims about this being the uh, graveyard of empires or Afghans are natural-born fighters. The um, knowledge needs to uh, go deeper than just uh, stating that military interventions are deemed to uh, fail or that uh, international assistance always leads to corruption. But going back to 2001, the decisions taken were anything but knowledge-based. The best analysis that we had of Afghanistan was in anthropology from the 1960s and the 1970s, a number of uh, exquisite studies. But in some ways, they had uh, expired. Through several decades of war, the Afghan society had changed. The understanding of how uh, Tribal feuds are resolved traditionally are by no means uninteresting, not even at the present. But they often fall short when you need to understand uh, ideologically driven movements that conduct war with uh, modern arms in tight conduct with um, external, external supporters. And it is somewhat disappointing when you look back to think about how much money has been used to produce knowledge about Afghanistan over the past 20 years. A lot of what's come out is disappointingly limited. Not to say that there are also a lot of good things. And somewhat ironically, the best things in my book are the things that are coming out at the present, at the time when most of the world have turned their attention elsewhere. Now, as I've already indicated, I don't think that there is one single explanation. I rather think that there is a combination of causes that interact in different ways at different points in time when it comes to explaining why Afghanistan, the adventure there, ended up as it is. And I'm not even sure, as I will return to in my conclusion, that there was a way in which the military intervention in 2001 could have led to success in the sense of a stable representative an economically viable Afghan state at peace with itself and its neighbors. Yes, yet with all these caveats, I do believe that there are a number of factors that we can point to that made success very unlikely. And the first one I'll dwell on is the exclusion of the Taliban. President George W. Bush saw Taliban and Al-Qaeda as one and the same. To Washington in the aftermath of the 11th September terror attack, it was necessary to remove the Taliban from power. This, of course, was in part inspired by the need for revenge, but it was also ultimately a strategic choice, although it was a poorly informed one. The Taliban were then, just like now, focused on Afghanistan, not on global jihad of any sort. They did host Al-Qaeda and other international terror networks, but ideologically, they were very far apart. The peace agreement that was concluded in Bonn in early December 2001 was what uh, my colleague, the Norwegian political scientist Astrid Surke, has called a victor's peace. The Taliban were not invited. And admittedly, it's quite hard to imagine that uh, the Taliban emir, Mullah Omar, 
could or even would have wanted to attend the Bonn Peace Conference. But prominent Taliban renounced the leadership of Mullah Omar. They offered themselves, but the U.S. and its allies made no effort to ensure this part of the political landscape in Afghanistan could be represented. And quite soon after the Bonn Conference, the then chairman of the interim administration, later president, Hamid Karzai, responded positively to an initiative from the Taliban leaders to negotiate. He was told in clear terms by Washington not to do so. And a number of similar initiatives over the next few years faltered for similar reasons. Fast forward to 2009, when Barack Obama entered the White House with a commitment to end the U.S. military engagement in Afghanistan, seeking a political solution. By then, the Taliban had become a significant military threat. Yet, even then, all so-called reconciliation initiatives were designed to divide and weaken the Taliban, rather than to somehow bring them into a political process as a force in their own right. In hindsight, this was possibly a time when there was a real mutually hurting stalemate between the parties on the Afghan battleground, but that window of opportunity was not tapped into. The breakthrough came in the summer of 2008, by which time Donald President, President Donald Trump had taken over in, uh, in the White House, and he wanted to get out of the so-called forever wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan. And he turned around 180 degrees and gave in to a demand that the Taliban had consistently made for more than a decade. Namely, we don't negotiate with an Afghan government whose legitimacy we don't recognize. We only want to uh, negotiate with the intervener, with the United States. And when the U.S. gave in to that, that was a major blow to the Afghan government. These talks in Doha, Qatar, resulted in an agreement signed on the 29th of April 2020. The trust of that agreement was a U.S. commitment to ensure the withdrawal of all international forces against the Taliban guarantee to prevent terror groups from staging new attacks against the U.S. and its allies from Afghan soil. The sidelining of the Afghan government, complemented by the fact that the U.S. was negotiating away a number of the main leverages that the Afghan government could potentially have held, such as uh, the Taliban prisoners held in custody, was a severe blow. And I think, in hindsight, when we look back, what was dressed up as a peace agreement was effectively a withdrawal agreement. Let me move to possible explanation number two, excessive violence. And it's already been discussed in numerous ways already this morning. I draw attention to a site which is not a precise, if not from an analyst on Afghanistan, but from a political scientist in the US looking at the American political scene. But the site stays with me. And the site is, if a fight erupts, watch the crowd. As you Ron pointed out this morning, war is relational. But, I would add, the parties are not static. It is how the parties fight the war that also affects whether or not they are able to grow their support base. And the intervention in Afghanistan was conducted by a combination of, on the one hand, U.S. air power, intelligence, and military advice. On the other hand, Afghan groups that were willing to take on the Taliban on the ground. These groups, of course, had a record. And their record was not necessarily much preferable to the record of the Taliban when it came to human rights abuses and ethnic warfare. After the Taliban were beaten and a new interim administration was in place, the international military stepped up its efforts. There were very few internationals on the ground in the early phases, but that changed from the beginning of 2022. And the focus was on areas in the south and the east of the country, the very areas in which the ta Taliban had had their main support, and it was directed both at eliminating Al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders. There was excessive use of house searches and night raids, People were humiliated, arrested, killed, and there was considerable infrastructural damage. And all of these contributed to turn at least parts of the population away from the government project and towards the Taliban. 
This came to the fore, for example, in the spring of 2009 after a bombing raid in the Balabaluk in the Farah province, all the way to the west of Afghanistan, where an estimated 120 people were killed. Kai Aide, the Norwegian diplomat, was at the time leading the UN, as a, a UN um, operation in Afghanistan, and he became quite critical of the uh, lack of transparency and unwillingness of the international forces to investigate. And I was in Kabul at the time, and I don't think uh, the numerous whispers that I had in my ears at various coffee shops and bars around Kabul could be called anything than a systematic smear campaign of the UN envoy. The problem was later taken much more seriously when Stan McChrystal took over the command of the, of the international forces in the summer of 2009. He went quite far in arguing that we have, have to accept greater losses to our own forces in order to uh, gain more support amongst Afghan civilians. That was a lesson learned that Donald Trump would later, give, uh, would la later abstain from. So let me move on to a third possible explanation, the empowerment of the warlords. There are many of them. The guy here is called Ismail Khan. He was a major warlord in the west, northwest of the country, the Herat region, from, in fact, all the way from 1978, when he was the first officer to swap sides long before the Soviet intervention, until the very present, still alive and still influential, regardless of whether he has official positions or not. Those guys were the ones doing the fighting for us on the ground in the intervention. And then they were quite handsomely rewarded, and the government structure was to a large extent based on those guys. Over time, there was an attempt to marginalize them, but that was not all that easy. Ismail Khan here, for example, was removed from his government post in Herat in the summer of 2004, and he was invited to take up a minister post in Kabul, which he first refused, then accepted, but spent most of his time still in Herat, where he was the de facto, although not the de jure, governor. And clearly, a real democracy would, 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 would require that you were able to marginalize the old warlords. But at the same time, we see that many of those are extremely robust. They have a lot of legs to stand down financially, militarily, as well as politically. But there is reason to ask whether the sort of middle way that uh, one ended up adopting was anything but a golden one, rather that it became a bit of a curse. On the one hand, one uh, weakened the warlords quite systematically, but on the other hand, one was unable to marginalize them entirely, so you ended up with uh, warlords with still considerable support bases that were angry and had every reason to be angry at the government and the interveners. So when they were called upon, as they were, for example, in the final battle for Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, they were rather unwilling to step forward. Okay, political centralization. This is uh, a copy of the Afghan constitution from 2004, which was to a very large extent based on the 1964 constitution. And here I'll be quick, but the point I do want to make is that this was an extremely centralized structure. And uh, the American Afghanistan researcher, Barney Rubin, once said that uh, it was quite a paradox that what you had in Afghanistan was the most centralized political structure in the world in what was possibly the de facto least centralized society in the world. And of course there was a reason for that. Because, and I think this is familiar from a lot of war settlements, when you craft a constitution, you do that at a stage where you need to make sure that you end violence or that violence doesn't re-erupt, and you craft the constitution in such a way that you have a buy-in from all those who can threaten the peace in the short term. Now, through that, 
And, and, and the solution in Afghanistan was to try to undermine the warlord through a centralized solution. But through that, you also craft a constitution that may be very poorly fit for the long-term challenges that the country, the country meets. Now, I'm not a constitutional expert, but I do believe that this is at the core, this is a core dilemma in constitutions in most post-conflict situations. And in fact, back in 2004, we did talk about Afghanistan under the big net of post-conflict. That's long again, long, long since forgotten, but that's the term we used back then. So let me move quickly on to uh, the dependence on uh, external report. In an early phase, it clearly is the US that sits with the authority, with uh, the ability to uh, initiate change, and that clearly also has international support. But of course, the legitimacy of entering any intervener quickly expires. And U.S. is faced with a dilemma, because on the other ha one hand, it does want to play down its influence, to downscale its influence, to strengthen the regime. On the other hand, the regime that it has to do with does not necessarily act according to U.S. will, uh, and thereby the paradox is created. This is what uh, David Lake has described as the state builder's dilemma. An Afghan government that is legitimate presumes gradual strengthening of its autonomy, but the external actor does require a government that is maximum loyal and thereby continues to instruct it. In the Afghan case, it was easy to legitimate that because both in the political, the uh, military and the financial domain the need for the US to intervene seemed uh, to be prevalent. For example, the way in which elections were conducted, the elections were, of course, as an, a key here to the democratic reforms as they are elsewhere. The first elections were, were widely attended, went fairly well, but when you come forward to 2009, there was no way in which the elections could have been settled without violence if the UN, US hadn't intervened to settle them. Militarily, we saw a structure that was entirely dependent on U.S. support with key niche capacities within the military structure. When they were pulled out, the whole, the whole structure collapsed. And financially, of course, this was the most aid-dependent uh, state anywhere in the world. Let me see how I'm faring on time. And then finally, let's move on to neighboring states as spoilers. And the image you have on um, the image you have on the um, on the board here is from is the front page of a book that I have co-authored with Sharbanu Tajbaksh. So this is a topic I spent some time on. And the white in the middle is Afghanistan. And the point here is that whereas all neighboring states of Afghanistan are very deeply involved in Afghanistan's interna internal conflicts they are not necessarily involved because they have a major concern about Afghanistan. And I'll use the case of Pakistan to exemplify that. For Pakistan, the existential threat is not Afghanistan, it is India, which of course goes all the way back to the liberation and the division in 1947, with multiple wars having followed, with the Kashmir issue remaining unresolved, and with two states with uh, nuclear arms facing each other. In 2005, the Bush administration signed a, um, an agreement with India about civilian use of nuclear energy. Now, this of course sounded like it had nothing to do with the situation in Afghanistan. But to Pakistan, another nuclear power, to see that uh, India was invited uh, by Washington to sign an agreement on nuclear energy with the potential for dual use of, uh, of that technology was, uh, was not warmly welcomed, to say the least. And it's quite interesting, because if you look at William Burns at the time, uh, uh, State Secretary in the Bush administration, now the director of the CIA, he wrote a book called The Back Channels in 2019. And he makes it clear that uh, he was fully aware, as were many of his advisors, that the signing of an agreement with India on nuclear technology would have 
direct repercussions for the situation in Afghanistan. So in other words, that deal would not only cost American soldiers' lives, it would potentially also weaken the likelihood of success in Afghanistan. None of this means that the Taliban or any other groups are externally directed marionettes. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. But it does mean that the external interveners in the neighborhood do contribute to exacerbate the conflict in very significant ways. And when it comes to the Taliban specifically, the Taliban certainly would not have existed if it didn't have a social basis in Afghan society, but it certainly wouldn't have been anywhere close to its current strength if it hadn't had sanctuaries, financial support, military support, and so forth from Pakistan. So in for the conclusions, and I have three of them. Does this at all make us any wiser as to why the international project in Afghanistan failed? I tend to think, as I said in my introduction, that all of these factors play a role, but I also think that they do so in interaction with others, and I think that the way in which they interact differ between different periods. So at the early stage, for example, in accounting for the remobilization of the Taliban, and let me take one step back here, I believe that several factors are at play. I think the Taliban's exclusion from political settlement, the excessive violence used by the interveners, the empowerment of the old warlords, and Pakistan's offer of sanctuary and support all play a major role in that early phase. If we fast forward to the last stage, the end game, over the spring and summer 2021, I think perhaps two other factors are more important, namely the political centralization and the vulnerability that stemmed from that, and the external dependence and the vulnerability that stemmed to that. All of which meant that the US entered a deal with the Taliban and pulled out militarily, and the state that had been built collapsed like a house of cards, or as I've said in a different publication, the US pulled the rug under a government it created. Oops, sorry. To my second and next to last conclusion, and I have to ask for one more minute, Terje. So can we imagine that a different approach would have produced a different result? Well, I believe that some sort of inclusion of the Taliban in 2001 could have done so. I also believe that if Obama had been able to give primacy to diplomacy over fighting in 2009-2010, there could potentially have been a compromise solution where the Taliban entered politics. I even think that when we fast forward to 2018, but then the problem was the opposite. What happened was that we had a rapid diplomatic solution being prioritized at the cost of sustainability. And I think all of this illustrates the heavy patent pendencies and the virtual inability to coordinate the instruments of force, diplomacy, and economic support. So finally, does all of this mean that the international project was impossible, that it was doomed to failure? Well, the intervention in Afghanistan certainly enjoyed widespread international support. Its legitimacy is undisputed. In the climate of the horrifying attacks in the US, the sympathy was uh, strong. We commonly presuppose certain criteria, though, and Yus Rahn has uh, reminded us of those this morning, before unleashing the instruments of war, the Yus ad bellum principle. And one is that all other courses of action are being fully explored, and I think that in itself is a question when it comes to negotiations with the Taliban after the terror attacks of 9-11. But in this context, I think another criterion is more important, and that is the criterion that there must be a reasonable chance of success. Success, of course, can be defined in different ways. But from the vantage point of the day, it's hard to define Afghanistan as a success by any standard. Some may think that there was a good chance of succeeding. I think we need to ask the fundamental question about whether success was sufficiently likely to merit an intervention in the first place. Thank you.